UK, big business, we make up in the UK. With them outlaws, no one will forever, and we mash hard, and we stay by the channel. Peace family, it's your boy Fonzie representing for BattleOnline.com and Genesis Radio Birmingham. And this week we joined with an exclusive special guest, and it's the digital multimedia specialist, Sabi Khan. What's good with you, man? Thank you so much, uh, Fonzie. Thank you so much. It's been such a long time that we haven't connected, and you know, we've all been busy in our industry and trade, you know. So, thank you so much for inviting me onto your amazing radio station, Genesis Radio. You know, big up to you and all the fans out there, you know. No doubt, man. We appreciate you, man. And we mentioned you being a digital media specialist, but that extends not just digitally, that's a media career going back, you know, well over a decade and then some still continuation doing work out there in the community within the hip hop community and stuff as well. So we definitely got to have a good conversation. You know, we've connected for some years and have always had a good relationship and, you know, done a lot of great work together. So it's good for us to connect and, you know, have the fans here a bit more about the work that you've been doing and where you're at with things now. Yeah, thank you so much. Like, it's been 25 years in the industry, uh, Fonzie, but you know, you know what it's like when we, when we first, first started off with, like, you know, the era of, like, Biggie and Tupac in the mid-90s and everything, you know, like, being the pioneer of British fusion music scene, along with Bobby Friction from BBC Radio and also with Telstar Nation back in the early 90s, you know, like, it's been a long journey for me, bro, you know, like... Uh, as you know, it's been so tough and so challenging with so much like diversity I had to go through, you know. Uh, but yeah, like uh, we're finally here now. As you know, I started off doing the Bangalore daytime as back in the 90s, you know, like promoting people like Punjabi MC, Apache Indian, Tasdera Nation, you know, working with so solid crew back in the 90s, then also, you know, then diversity into the hip hop and R&B scene, bro. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, before we really get into it, because we really want to explore, you know, just some of your early introductions to getting into hip hop. You know, what drew you into promoting that style of music, especially within a period of time within the UK. But um, we want to extend our condolences because we know that you were last year mother this year and stuff as well. So uh, this year, a lot of us have been brought with a lot of, you know, bereavement and loss and stuff. So it's definitely one more extend our condolences and hope that you keep it well and stuff within that. Yeah, you know, I like, thank you so much for the, your your generous uh, condolences to my mom. You know, like, she's been a great inspiration to me to get in the music industry. You know, like um, when I was 18, I was a DJ and I set up college parties and everything. And she encouraged me and motivated me to get, you know, to create more diversity between the Asian and black people uh, and, you know, do events to promote more black and Asian music, you know. So, uh, you know, she encouraged me and motivated me to go into the industry. So, you know, like I used to, uh, I used to, I used to be a break dancer back in the 80s, you know, like uh, doing the electric boogaloo and all that, you know. Uh, started off doing break dancing, you know, in uh, 1985. Now, I mean, my mom supported me a lot on that you know, when I was the age of 10. Then all of a sudden, like, you know, as, as you know, as generations evolve, you slowly pick up new things, you adapt new things, you create more ideas, you create more creativity and inspiration you know so yeah like um you know it's been like a long long journey for me and you know my mother's always been like a pivot behind me and everything supporting me and encouraging me and like her life you know uh, her passing away had a massive effect on me so on 4th of march this year then you know my guru and my uh teacher Tav Stereo Nation uh, from your area from Birmingham he passed away a month later which I've known for 30 years um, and, you know, uh, these couple of deaths had had a massive impact on me mentally and psychologically, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. Have, have you been, um, you know, we've been coping and getting that help and support with that? We know the industry can be tough itself and then especially with additional pressures, it can be hard to, con you know, to continue maintaining and still working with all these, um, you know, additional losses and stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, the industry itself, like the media entertainment industry, it's always had issues with, uh, you know, people like, you know, uh, one minute you might be in a big record deal, one day you might do that record deal, one day you might be doing this tour, the next minute you might do that tour. Uh, in this industry, uh, there's a lot of losses and gains. Vol volatile, quite volatile. Yeah, that's it's a volatile industry. And do you know what it is like when you're suffering from bereavement? like I have, and, um, you know, the past three months have been very, very tough. 
Uh, and, you know, there's only a few people that you could turn to support because, you know, we had COVID. And as you know, I had COVID as well back when I came back from New York back in uh, February uh, 2020. I had to spend one uh, month in hospital, you know, and so, you know, where the industry itself went through so much, uh, you know, trauma, like legend industry, the entertainment industry. So it has been traumatic for uh, for myself and a lot of people in the industry, you know. It's been very, very hard. And um, especially when a lot of the artists and the musicians, um, you know, have got huge mortgages out, huge loans out, and they've got no work coming in. Uh, you know, like, it's, it's hard for them to pay the money off. Like, uh, a lot of the people that I know in the music industry, they've got mortgages worth like a few thousand pounds, and they were struggling for two years to pay everything off, you know. And, you know, and plus there's not, there's not much support in the music industry. Uh, out there, like mental support, not uh, psychological support. Um, you know, luckily I had a few uh, professional counsellors uh, that were counselling me through the COVID lockdown and also uh, my bereavements. Uh, but normally, um, you know, it's very, very hard to get counselling for entertainers. You know, it's a massive size, you know, psychological effect, you know, when, when a bereavement happens because, you know, we are artistic people. We are creative people. You know, we think visually. We, uh, you know, we have a creative mind. And when you have a creative, inspirational mind, and and something uh, hits you hard, you kind of go off balance. You know, you can't concentrate, and it's very, very hard to go back on the tracks again. So, you know, I think there should be more support to entertainers like myself and other rappers and musicians. Uh, you know, producers, uh, directors in the industry. Yeah, no real talk. And, you know, I want to take that time to actually tip my cap and um, give a bit of a plug to an organization called Music Minds Matter. And I came across these guys through the Help Musicians uh, Union amidst the pandemic. And what they actually do, which I thought was quite good, is they have a hotline which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's dedicated mental health support line and service to the whole UK music community. So if you work within music and you're struggling to cope or you know someone who is, you can talk to them, you can give them a call on 0808-802-8008. And it doesn't have to be a crisis or even about music. They're there to listen, to support, give help at any time and have a bit of online resources. So I think... Um, as you said, there needs to be more initiatives like that as well, just additionally to help support the creative because it's a different type of people that work and have to deal with different types of um, pressures just amidst the own creative environment, let alone the pressures of the world that everybody has to deal with. So sometimes uh, it takes, I suppose, specialist listeners to be able to understand that, you know, artists and creatives, sometimes they have a, uh, complex personalities and complex issues and stuff sometimes that they're dealing with. I'd say I agree with you. I think like, you know, the it's an amazing charity that you mentioned. It's an amazing organization. Um, um, I'd, you know, I'll have to promote that as well, you know, uh, in the events that I'm doing later on in the year. Uh, and you know, because a lot of the uh, singers and the rappers, um, you know, they've done so well and they have they become you know, like, you know, they come in closing the bubble. They don't want to leave that bubble because they believe when they leave that bubble, it's going to be like a, uh, you know, an insult to them, you know, all that they downgraded themselves by mental uh, issues. You know, they feel a bit embarrassed to talk about it. This is why, uh, you know, I've been encouraging a lot of uh, artists, even when, like, when the COVID happened and I was speaking to a lot of the American artists in America, like, I was speaking to, like, uh, uh, YDB, uh, uh, you know, the uh, son of uh, ODB from Wu-Tang, you know, uh, I'll be speaking to him, I'll be speaking to Judah Priest, I'll be speaking to Kali Ranks, uh, Cannabis, you know, all these American rappers, I've been like helping them because they were struck badly. And in America, getting support, mental support with musicians is extremely hard, um, you know, because, you know, they they work is like their education well sorry their medical system is all, all privatized um and that's why they tend to find it a lot harder for like you know to get that kind of support and the only thing that they could do is talk to friends like you know me yourself and me uh who could counsel them you know uh but yeah you know like they should they should be much more um you know um advisory stuff because you know a lot of the musicians they work like 12 hours a day seven days a week they're in the studio yep. you know and like you know 
when, when people, when I hear conspiracy theories like, oh, they sold the soul of to the devil and they sold the soul of, but it's not, it's they, they, they're sacrificing their families because the time they spend in the studio time and the, the events time because they're not, they're not hardly at home, they're sacrificing good family time. And that's a detrimental effect on a lot of these artists when they're touring and everything and, you know, in the recording studio. Uh, and, you know, like I said, like, m m many of them don't even get that support. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like luckily, I'm a trained counsellor. You know what I mean? Like, I've done uh, domestic violence counselling back in, you know, 2006 with the NHS. Uh, so I've got, like, I, you know, my way of helping people. Um, so... The, not many people like myself, you know, like myself, who are music promoters, you know, what I mean, uh, who can actually, uh, you know, provide support to the fellow artists and everything, you know. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's important, man. You make a good point. I mean, when we look at just where music is now, we know that, as you said, a lot of artists they definitely do face just some of those additional stresses and sometimes, you know, working rigorous amounts of times and hours and um, expending a lot of energy and stuff. So anything where we can promote well-being and betterment and stuff is definitely important. We know that you have spent conversations with, you know, some rappers that we know, we won't mention any names, you know, but off the record, I know you've been there to support a few guys in Europe and around the, you know, around the world and stuff. So, um, I mean, let's take it back from there then. So I guess, you know, when we think about you as a promoter, you've got an extensive, you know, decorated list of events that you've done over the years throughout your tenure. I mean, what stands out to you as a promoter and um, who are some of the best acts that you say that you've worked with? You know, um, I'm from the, you know, like it's been over two decades, uh, like 25 years of uh, sheer hard work going out in the evening. When I first started promoting 25 years ago, um, I used to go in the freezing rain and it flies out in Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, London, um, you know, outside clubs and bars where nobody wanted to do these unsociable hours. Uh, and I was like dedicated to this uh, hard work. And, you know, my first uh, breakthrough was when I promoted Punjabi MC back in 1998. I gave it breakthrough uh, in one of my Bangor events. And that's how I started off then, you know, um, after the, getting the massive high profile, then I start working uh, back uh, in the early 2000s. You know, I was one of the first uh, British promoter to work with Def Jam Records in, in uh, New York. And Def Jam Records approached me. Uh, Mr. Cohen uh, called me uh, back in early 2002 and he asked me to work with him in regards to promoting Keith Murray. At that time, uh, Keith Murray was signed to Def Jam Records. He, uh, actually, he was uh, about to get signed to Def Jam Records, and the, uh, the directorship of Def Jam Records in New York, they wanted me to uh, promote many of the artists in the UK. Uh, so I signed an agreement with them to bring Keith Murray out. So he was my, main, he was my first American artist to work for with uh, in the UK uh, from Def Jam, and this was like early 2000, and I, I was the first British promoter to be given this contract by an American uh, you know, a record label. So after we did Keith Murray um, back in uh, early 2000, then I got approached by Black Eyed Peas manager, Paulo Molina. He contacted me and he goes, look, we're going to be coming to UK and we we're looking for like a tour manager and would you like to take on the task of working the Black Eyed Peas? And, you know, and, I, and I thought, look, you know, gosh, this is like a dream come true. Like, you know, my age was only like about, about 27, 28 at that time. And, you know, not everybody in the American music industry knew who I was, like, uh, for people from Latin Record, you know, I mean, Def Jam, uh, you know, uh, Republic, Sony, uh, EMI, you know, I mean, they all knew who I was at, the, at that prior, you know, prime age. And, you know, that's where it's uh, rolled on from, uh, from, you know, like, uh, you know, I just want to praise God, you know, I mean, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I want to praise my mom who kind of encouraged me to go forward. Because not many people get a chance like this. It's like, it was like a one in a million chance to work with, the, you know, a lot of the recognized American musicians and artists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, like, as time went past, you know, I mean, uh, like, you know, Black Eyed Peas were, were the best people I've ever worked with. Um, you know, along as with like, you know, DJ 45 from EPMD, DJ Motivate from LA, um, you know, and a lot of, and Grandmaster Flash not to mention. So, you know, the the, the list of A-listers goes on uh, from the, because, you know, like, well, once you break into the industry, they know that you're a professional promoter. And, you know, there's been times that I've taken losses in a 
Uh, most promoters will just like back off. They go, oh, we're not going to do this show because we're going to lose money and this and that. But I still went ahead with it. So I think the consistency uh, and the dedication and hard work kind of encouraged, invited me a lot of A-list uh, artists to work with. Uh, yeah, that was pretty dope. And I think, you know, just for the record, even also a fun fact, you know, one of my first UK performances opening for a US act and, you know, a huge US act at the time would, would be Keith Murray was put together by yourself and stuff. And, you know, I was always grateful <laughs> for that opportunity and stuff. And, you know, yeah. still grateful for the opportunity because at that time, as you know, a lot of the local artists here in the UK were doing, you know, sort of like the local shows that promoters were putting on at like pubs and, and stuff like that. And I always felt like I didn't really want to do those types of shows. I, you know, I felt like I wanted to, be a part of the culture, why that, like it is in the States with, you know, supporting like the, the, the big talent and stuff as well. So, um, you know, you was able to put some of that stuff together where, you know, Thank we you. could call Keith Murray, Capone from CNN and, you know. And, and, and you know, that's, what, that's what we did. Our first, uh, I remember like uh, 15, uh, 15 years ago, we did uh, Capone, and, uh, you know, Capone in Liverpool and you, and that's where we actually met and, We've had that like fifteen years relationship, you know. I mean, on a, on a trustworthy, all weather friends, you know. I mean, and we work on many projects uh, like with Keith Murray, with uh, you know, uh, 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 the uh, E Dog from uh, Boston. Uh, we work with you know, like so oh, many talented yeah. music. Yeah, and you know, and and uh, you know, like um, you, the artist, have been professional as well. Like you, the artist, that you have actually. Uh, promoted the British hip hop scene to the next level, and uh, you were one of the pioneers of the British uh, hip hop scene, uh, the urban music scene. So, you know, it's it's been uh, like a legendary uh, journey for both of us. You know, I mean, we've both been legend in our industry. You know, and uh, you as a musician and an artist, and myself as a promoter and an event organizer, it's been a massive. Uh, you know, not many people have survived the industry. No. Uh, we are the only handful. Uh, that have actually survived, and you know, uh, then I'm probably the longest running hip hop promoter in UK. You know, what I mean, that's actually worked with many people and have been recognised. And you, and you, probably the youngest urban uh, artist in Midlands, and uh, probably the whole of the UK has been running as well. So it's good to have that diversity. And you know, like our industry is so small. Like in America, um, they kind of have uh, a lot of uh, they have competition in America, but they support each other. What I find with the UK uh, industry, uh, whether it's Asian uh, or black people, you find a lot of rivalry, a lot of hatred amongst each other. And that is kind of letting everybody down, to be honest with you. I kind of like, you know, get really upset when I see, you know, Asians attacking Asians and look at the negative points and, you know, want to like slander them, uh, bully them, you know? Yeah. You know, is it because that person not above that person, so they want to attack them. Same with the uh, British uh, black artists as well. They get that hatred as well when this, these things are wrong. You know, they, we should be united as a, as a, you know, as a culture, as a hip hop culture, helping each other and motivating each other. You know, and for, for me to have that diversity and transparency have led me like for twenty five years of success in the industry. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you mentioned even just like diversity and stuff and inclusion. It's one thing that would been able to share a similar road in, as you said, going back 15 years and stuff in, in different capacities, even with you work with Bradford Asian Radio, you know, you invited me out to the radio station up there. I remember that, and, I remember um, that. You know, <laughs> from, from work in Dubai and stuff, and, um, and even most importantly, you know, it's even though it's a bit of a sombre tone because we lost Hussein Fate or one of the, you know, premier members of the Outlaws who was, um, Two parts official group, you know, exactly. we were able to do one of their only UK tours, and you know, yourself putting on their last ever tour in Dubai. I mean, what was that like? The significance of that as well. Do you know, uh, Fondi? Do you know when um, we did the tour in the UK? We did a Birmingham show in UK, uh, and uh, you know, I'm so sad that I wasn't there at that time because um, I know we both organised it and promoted it and. Uh, uh, went ahead with it and unfortunately I wasn't there because I was on a business meeting in Dubai uh, and um, you know this you know the sad part is I actually you know I was a big fan of Hussein Fatal uh, and um, you know it's and it's sad to see him die of such a great talent from the outlaws and um, you know I was actually speaking to him 
on the day he died, um, you know, he called me up. Uh, I could still remember the day because I, I gave his work permit out. Um, you know, I issued his work permit. And, um, you know, then um, he called me up uh, saying that, look, you know, are my flights ready yet? Then I said, yeah, your flights ready. This was too big, too big for the show. You know, finally, you know, like, uh, like I said I, uh, before, I, I was very unfortunate. I didn't get to meet him on our Birmingham show. And I was in Dubai at that time. And uh, the really uh, sad thing about it was I was actually speaking to him on the day he died in a car crash. Uh, so he called me up in the morning uh, before I leave in Atlanta to New Jersey. And uh, as we were talking, he put the phone down. He wanted to know what happened to his work permits uh, and, um, you know, to get to make sure that his work permits were there on time. So I said to him, look, go to uh, New York, collect your flights, then I'll meet you in Dubai. So, uh, so what happened was I got a call in the morning from um, the Dubai. I got a call from the club owners in Dubai and they said to me, look, we're sorry to hear about Hussein Fatal. And I'm thinking, you know, you know what they're talking about. You know, they, you know, they, you know, they got a call, for, you know, uh, the Hussein Fatal. Then I go, look, I'm going mean, to, I was just speaking to him seven hours early. You know, I was speaking to him seven hours early. This was like two weeks before our Dubai show. So anyway, like I got a call from the Dubai main newspaper called The National and a few radio stations called me from Dubai trying to confirm his death and everything. And I, to be honest, I was sleeping at that time. I just, I was quite shocked, you know what I mean? And uh, then I just checked on MTV. I just went on Google and typed his name in Hussein Fatal. And he just come up, MTV put it up like one hour early that he's passed away in the car crash. And, um, you know, that just kind of like, you know, that was just uh, that was just soul destroying, you know. That was just like heartbreaking to see a, such a talented artist like Hussein Fatal die, and he was only one of the two packs. Uh, one, side of the, one of the originals. To be honest with you, then I, you know, I just said to the club owner that I want to make this into a tribute show for Hussein Fatal and Tupac. So I ended up making the Dubai show uh, for Tupac and uh, Hussein Fatal as the memory for them. It was heartbreaking for me, and uh, it was just really emotional to speak to somebody that ate out before they pass away. It was just shocking, you know what I mean? But yeah, it was a good show. We had a good show in Dubai. We had like like over a thousand people there. People loved it, you know what I mean? They had a good time, but they only came to pay tribute to Hussein Fatal and Tupac. Yeah, so, you know, that's the story behind that, really. You know, it was a very, very emotional uh, show that was really, yeah. Yeah, no, we're glad that um, it was still able to go ahead as a tribute show and stuff as well. So we definitely want to say, you know, big up to Noel and Edie as well. Yeah, yeah. you know, like I spoke to them. I couldn't, I took consultation from them. I said, look, if we if we cancel the show, you know, what I mean, we don't, I don't have any like detrimental effects on our business and our, you know, event and everything. So. You know, uh, they said, okay, fine, they should know, like, you know, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, we'll still come be uh, coming and everything, you know. And, uh, like, you know, the music room where the where the show was being held in Dubai, they were very, like, uh, considerate. They were very compassionate. They were very caring, you know, because it was such a big thing because he died two weeks before the event and it was just like a massive knock-on effect for everybody. And they was actually able to, you know, catch up with Napoleon Mutar Bill out there. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah no, 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 matter, no matter how sad they sound, like um, like me uh, and uh, Eddie and Noble were in Dubai Marina, just by coincidence, and um, by coincidence, um, ne uh, Napoleon was there, Motobil was there uh, in Dubai Marina, and you know we, we just like we didn't know because like in the next minute, um, you know. You know, Motorbill messages Eddie and he goes, uh, look, we, I've seen your state of the year in Dubai. Uh, he goes, so am I. And we just said, where are you? He goes, oh, I'm in Marina. So basically, he was like about, just like about a few hundred yards from us by coincidence. Yes. And, and, yes. you know, and you know, God bless. This is how God works in mysterious ways. Because I'm a very God-fearing person, you know. And like, when you have a clean heart and when you have a clean soul, when, you know, when you actually love somebody in the past, you actually meet them in, in very unexpected places. And so, uh, you know, Eddie Noble, they were shocked. They go, oh, where, where about you going? You know, it was only like a few hundred yards away. So we just walked over, me, Eddie Noble walked over where he was. He was in a restaurant getting treated by 
some Muslim guy, you know, I mean, who are doing like a press conference about Islam and all that, you know, about his conversion to Islam and uh, giving his journey as the outlaw to become a Muslim. So anyway, we were quite surprised and we went for dinner and, you know, we're like, we were just like, just like all of a sudden, like, you know, the universe just connected us all together, you know, so yeah. very unique and very like, you know, nostalgic. And yeah, uh, but yeah, that was a very, very like out of the blue thing, you know. Uh, no. But yeah, that was uh, something that I, I didn't expect anywhere, neither did them. Yeah, because you see, Mutabu, he's in Saudi Arabia all the time. He's married in Saudi and he, he doesn't hardly come to UAE. And that's, you know, that's the time he came on. You know, like, well, you know, we, it was just like a, like, uh, a get together just to celebrate the Hussein fate of life, really. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, definitely, man. I mean, speaking of celebrating life, uh, you spoke earlier about your good friend and mentor, Taz Stereo Nation. I mean, how important was his contributions to the Asian music scene within the UK? Right. And you see, you know, yeah, do you know, like uh, Taz Stereo Nation, I've known it for nearly 30 years. I did it, I did his first event in Bradford back, um, you know, in 1998 uh, when he was up and coming. And we don't, but me and him actually worked before that as well. But I organized the first event, and you know, from there on, he became my mentor, my teacher, my guru, uh, and you know. Like he's like uh, eight years older than me. Like you know, but he was always there for me, guiding me, teaching me new ideas, new uh, skills, and you know, like he he was like a, like a second father figure to me. You know, um, he was part of my family, my second father. You know, my second father and my teacher, my mentor, and you know, it was through him, like you know, that brought me a lot of success in the industry uh, because. Uh, his connections, like, you know, the last five years I took over his bookings, uh, you know, I was booking him as an artist. He trusted me to become his booking agent in the last five years. And that kind of, like, helped me and uh, to advance my skills uh, and abilities. You know I mean? Like, cause he had more professional uh, singing skills. So his demise was a massive, like, hit for me. Like, you know, I still remember the day on 29th of April, um, you know, uh, I was at my friend's house uh, and we were just, you know, going through the sampling old music, you know, I mean, like, you know, the, uh, uh, Beastie Boys, uh, Cool and the Gang, Madonna, Michael Jackson, you know, I mean, then all of a sudden I felt kind of a, a heaviness, a heaviness on my body. And I'm just thinking, you know, I never felt that before. You know, I mean, I don't know what's going on. You know, I mean, like then this was in the evening. Then I started getting messages. Oh, sorry to hear about Tell Stereo Nation. You know, I'm sorry. And then I'm thinking like, you know, oh, my God, like this can't be serious and everything, you know. But, um, you know, it was just really, really emotional because everybody knew me uh, as his booking agent uh, and, uh, you know, and his student. And that just kind of like shook me. It's like losing a brother. It's like losing a teacher. It's very, very emotional. You know, you know, I actually spoke to him like few days before my mum passed away. Like I spoke to him first of March and my mum passed away on fourth of March. I actually spoke to him then. Wow. Yeah, I actually like spoke to him before my mum passed away and like, you know, and he would just check it up on my mom and see how she's doing and, and I told him the situation. Uh, and um, then, you know, a few days later I called his manager, Mark. I said to Mark, look, you know, this situation, my mum passed away and you know, then he tells me, oh, Tal's going to coma. And I'm thinking, damn, man, like, you know, Tal's going to coma. Like, this is really shocking. You know what I mean? And I know that he met what medical condition he had. Uh, you know, like I said, that's, you know, that's really sad that he's going to coma. And, you know, I, you know, Mark, his manager gave me condolences for my mom. Then a few days after I spoke to Mark, I get, I get a call from one of my, mutual, you know, our mutual friend, Sabji, who's one of my painters, who does a lot of my paintings, which I sell in auctions. And Sabja rings me up. She's from Coventry. And she goes, oh, um, I've got some bad news for you. And I said, oh, God, I mean, don't say, you know, Taz has passed away, you know what I mean? That was what I was expecting, you know what I mean? Then she goes, no, Mark's passed away. I said, I, said, I just spoke to Mark. There was nothing wrong with him. You know, he was not diseased, no health condition, nothing. And he passes away because he couldn't take the emotion of what Taz was going through. You know what I mean? He got emotional, then he died of a heart attack just with the, you get emotional with Taz. And then, you know, that just hit me like a ton of bricks, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, when Taz came out of coma and he found out uh, that Mark's passed away, then he just 
died of shock you know I mean we just that's going on it's been a very very traumatic two you know three months you know I mean the roller coaster you know I mean like so many losses you know I mean? and they've been like you know it's like watching a movie from the you know I mean when yeah. somebody passes away like and you know me as a music promoter you know I'm, I'm like very creative as I said it had like a detrimental effect on me you know like thinking about it too much you know so you know the but yeah like you know Taz was very close to me another artist which was close to me was Sidhu Musawalam I know you mentioned to, uh, to you know last time to me you know I actually met Sidhu Musawala in um, uh, the Wilder Festival last year okay. yeah he was the first uh, British uh, sorry he was the first Indian artist to come on stage you know what I mean with a turban on you know what I mean like I met him we, you know we had a shisha together you know what I mean in a um, the Miss Lounge near Heathrow Airport after the Wireless Festival. And, um, you know, I was speaking to him and his booking manager five days before he passed away. Uh, and he wanted to tour Pakistan. He wanted to come to Pakistan and do some events there, do like a unity event in Pakistan. Like, you know, because as you know, on the, both countries are at war with each other since the creation, you know, I mean, since yeah. independence. And so he wanted to create a unity tour in Pakistan. So... I was I was helping him organize that, you know. I mean, speak to him about it. Then, like four days later, he dies. He gets gone down. You know, I mean, like I'm thinking, what is going on? You know, I mean, it's... yeah. Some say just with you know, even just what was reported on that situation. Have they found anybody responsible for his, his murder yet? Well, the Sidhu Musawala murders have been claimed by some gangsters back in Canada. You know, I mean, and uh, they claim to show him, but. To, to be honest, nobody actually knows it because you know he was deep into politics in uh, in um, India. You know, what I mean, like, uh, but like the the government took his protection away. You know, I mean, he was vulnerable to get assassinated. And, you know, like country like India, Pakistan, you know, like his assassination is very common in political parties. So you know, like he, you know, wanted to create a unity. You know, I mean, bring India, Pakistan to play closer to each other through music and arts. You know, there's so many conspiracy theories, like, you know, some claim that it was gunned down by the politicians, opposition parties, uh, some, you know, the gangster from kind of claim the responsibility, but we don't, we don't know actually, we don't really know what actually happens. And, you know, countries like India, Pakistan, you know, it's very, very hard to get law and order. You know, when somebody gets killed, you know, you don't know who's done it, who's behind it, you, you don't know anything really, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we did hear some stuff that was um, conspiracy related somewhat, I guess, um, some co comparisons to Tupac and sort of, you know, I guess the political aspect of that. And I guess that's one thing where we look at, even as a segue, with just hip hop and the expansion of the music and people have, you know, adapted it as a form that they would like to use for their expressions and stuff like that now and stuff. So I guess that segues into just like new music and new artists. We've also heard that you've been working with your son, who's actually producing and releasing new music. Yeah, do you know, like I want to touch on the first thing that you mentioned, the comparison between Tupac and uh, Sidhu Musa Walla. Uh, both were pol against politics, right? Both knew the uh, agenda um, to control the um, whether it's color or religion or whatever with Tupac, you know, I mean, he was very political about the racism in America, about black people getting oppressed. You know, I mean, uh, uh, to, uh, they can't get good jobs, they can't get good work, they're getting oppressed through the media, the police. Um, as you know, Rodney King was at that time the issue with Rodney King in LA. So there were a lot of racial issues, and Tupac was trying to touch on them highlights, and you know how why black people still getting oppressed even after so many years, after Martin Luther King and Malcolm X have given them the civil rights. And so with Sidhu Musawala, he was more of like an independent fighter because he he was he wanted to get independence from um, uh, he wanted to have India the Khalistan movement, the Sikh movement, to be independent from uh, India. And he was politically, you know, for that. He was for, so both, uh, you know, for, for my for my conspiracy theory, like, you know, both like were, for, you know, in that political spectrum. You know, what I mean, they were in that political spectrum, and you know, like as you know, uh, you know, whenever a musician gets a mic and talks about politics or anything like that, he gets very, very 
listen to it gets you know you know highlight, highlighted more in the media uh so you know both can, of the murders they can were, demonize them a lot more because they yeah their voices exactly yeah you know like you know uh politics uh and music don't mix and a lot of the rebel uh musicians you know i mean like immortal technique a lot of the black rappers a lot of the asian rappers in india they're fighting for the civil rights you know i mean even still and you know the the people the government don't like that they want that uh, you know that kind of like uh, uh, oppression but it's like um, it's white collar oppression you know it's through media and masses you know what I mean so you know I, I personally believe like you know um, you know Tupac uh, and uh, Sidhu Musa were, were, were murdered because of their political views really and yeah thank you so much uh, for bringing my son up uh, Izzy and um, you know, he's working on big things like, you know, he's at the moment he's doing um, medicine um, to, to become a doctor at Manchester Met, you know, um, and he's also, that was his passion to get into music and arts, just like I did back in when I was in my late teens. And um, he wanted to become an artist and a musician. He wanted to, like, create a new genre of music uh, called New Rap, which is like uh, reviving the old rap scene, you know, what where rap originated from. You know, by adding new tunes, new vocal, modern music to uh, what hip hop was back in the early 70s and the 80s, how we started off. So my son is into that, like, you know, pop rap, new rap type of uh, genre of music. And, you know, he's, he, at the moment he's done stuff for BBC, one extra. He's been touring with Shawnee B. Uh, he's been in a lot of events in Bradford, Middlesbrough. Uh, he's been invited to do an event uh, in Sunderland in a football stadium in July. So, yeah, like, uh, his inspirations are being, like, you know, the East Coast and the West Coast rappers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah definitely, man. I mean, it's always good to hear the new generation bringing their aspects and stuff, but still wanting to keep the fundamentals of the tradition alive, which is also important and stuff, you know, because, you know, music's got so far and wide and diverse now, especially with the UK scene, we see a lot of evolving sounds and stuff like that as well. And um, I think everything's kind of culminating into a nice little point now where we're seeing a lot of new artists emerging and coming out and, you know, making their voices be heard and stuff like that. So, uh, oh, yeah. Do, you, yeah. do you know what it's funny? Do you know, like, we, like, I've I've come from the uh, the the old school hip hop uh, when it uh, at that time UK was going through racism, you know there was a lot of racism towards black and Asian people in Birmingham, London back in the eighties and the nineties, and you know that's one of the reasons why uh, I go into hip hop industry because I found a voice there. Like we had a lot of extreme racism up north, and you know hip hop gave me a voice to do, you know promote black music, promote Asian music. Few, you know, combine black, Asian, and you know, pop music together. So, you know, that's one of the reasons that I got encouraged into music because, uh, for me, um, you know, the hip hop was a rally cry uh, to it was like a rebellion music. You know, uh, it's to see, you know, to promote oppression in UK, and what's going on, also oppression abroad, like you know, in Africa, in Asia, a lot of the people were getting oppressed back in the eighties and the nineties. A lot of political turmoil in the Middle East, you know. What I mean, a lot of like uh, situations in Africa, civil wars, and you know, like uh, the the hip hop music. were, you know, like it kind of encouraged me to have a political voice, to promote the, uh, you know the situation around the world. And you know, f from there onward, you know, like, I got a lot of respect from uh, major record labels in America, uh, New York, LA. You know, I mean, and they wanted me to like, you know. Uh, out of that kind of technique and like, you know, a lot of people were scared of uh, political uh, aspects of rap music because they were scared, oh, if we rap, we might be arrested by freedom, that or whatever, you know, like people just too scared to talk about issues like racism, uh, you know, towards black and Asian people. Well, I mean, it's when even you mentioned like Tupac earlier, slightly on a tangent, but I guess it ties in because, you know, even like you just said about artists using that kind of political awareness and dynamic when he actually gave the original outlaw members like their outlaw names it was names of people that were being I guess politically charged with different crimes or viewed a certain way in the media you know he had Edie obviously from Edie from Edie Amin um, yeah. Hussein Fatal from Saddam Hussein Castro from Fidel Castro 
Gaddafi, yeah. from Mumia Gaddafi. So, uh, exactly. you know, and Khomeini, which was a um, more priestly court. Yeah, well, that's, that's where a lot of the outlaws picked the names up because due to, uh, due to how the American government, uh, the US government, saw a lot of these the, um, people in Africa and Middle East, like, a lot, a lot, you know, the US government wanted to throw a lot of these people because, it, you know, they had their political interest in the Middle East and North Africa. And that's why the outlaws named themselves, like, you know, Gaddafi, Castro, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of these names, you know I mean? Napoleon, you know, uh, Eddie Amin from Uganda, you know? Uh, and a lot of the, uh, you, know, you want to show, they were outlaws in the eyes of the Western world, eyes of the American government, they were the outlaws. You know, I mean, they weren't listening to the American government. They were running their own, you know, how they wanted to run their own country. Then that kind of irritated the United States government. You know, what I mean, that's why the outlaws were created because, you know, they they saw the how the American wanted to bring change to the country. You know, what I mean, by through oppression and all that. And this is why they became like that. But it's a very interesting story with the outlaws and everything. I believe there should be a movie made about that. Uh, it could be. I mean, maybe one day we'll see the old lies on me. Two part movie. And there's been talks of a, a different one because you know that one was sort of mixed received when it comes to the critics and stuff like that. But you know how that is. So I guess you know before we wind out, we want to look at just in the future where we're at now or current time. Is there going to be any upcoming shows or productions that you can let people know about, or are you keeping things under the radar at the minute? <laughs> you know, like. Um... Uh, that's what everybody said to me. They go, look, Sabi, are we getting email? Are we getting calls from Dubai, from, you know, from even now from Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah? They want me to do a lot of hip-hop shows in uh, Jeddah at the F1 Grand Prix. Uh, we get calls from Miami and LA. And, you know, like, since uh, 2018, I've been working on major, major plans. I've been keeping them undercover. And the thing with me is I always have a policy, a very, a very, uh, my doctrine is always this, like, you know, loose lips, thick ships. You know what I mean? That's always been my policy. And this is the reason how I survived for 25 years. You know, also my haters and my bullies and all that. I survived for so long, you know what I mean? Because I've never ever uh, showed my policies or my plans of action or uh, my doctrines. And and that's, that's, that's one of the reasons uh, a lot of the artists have become famous through me because you know, I'm, a very, I'm a very superstitious person. I'm a very, uh, I believe in the occult, you know what I mean? And I believe that if you start releasing information early, people give the evil eye. They put evil eye on you, you know, like we call in Arabic, Nazar, you know what I mean? That kind of ruined plans, you know what I mean? And if you make a plan up and start telling people about it, you might, you know, there's people that might hate you. They say, oh, like, you know, that might not work. They start putting doubt in you and all that. And, um, you know, that way, you know, like I always keep my plan of action very, very uh, discreet. But like there, there are a couple of events coming up. I'm working with you, God, from Wu Tang Clan. Uh, I'm working with YDB, uh, the, you know, uh, young dirty bastard uh, ODB son uh, uh, from the Wu Tang. Uh, and um, there's a film production I'm working with an American company, uh, and um, they're based in LA. We just be getting some funding coming through for that. Um, that's gonna be a British crime thriller. Uh, and you know, like we're trying to get artists like Patrick Stewart and Sean Bean of the main cast. Uh, in that movie, we've got like some of the Wu Tang rappers and some of the East Coast rappers in there. So that's going to be a very interesting project. And we also got British artists as well. Like we've got, um, you know, the Heartless Crew. We've got Skinny Man uh, interested. We've got even yourself interested as well. So you know, like uh, the the film pro project is going to be one of the biggest projects I've done because it's got like a budget of like five million. Um, US dollars, which is around about four million pounds, you know what I mean? So it's going to be shot in three locations, UK, Miami, New York, and Dubai. So we're looking forward to that anyway, three different countries. But yeah, a lot of the projects which I do, I tend to keep them very, very discreet and quiet. A lot of my clients that I work with in the media industry, they don't, because uh, I got to sign a non, you know, NDA, non-disclosure agreement. You know, and you know, it's a confidential act where I can't release data or information to other people. No matter what, even my family don't know. Even my like my sons don't know. My father don't know who I'm working with and what plans I've got coming up. You know what I mean? Because you know, I respect my clients' uh, wishes. You know, they want me to do a non-disclosure agreement, and you know, they've got some like million-dollar projects. I want to keep that very discreet. 
So, like, once I'm, uh, once I create the plan of action and trying to materialize, then I release minimum information to get people interested or attracted, or if I want to get people on board, then I release certain information. And I think that's one of the reasons, like I said, you know, I've been in the industry for 25 years while other promoters have come and gone, they've gone bankrupt, they've lost money because, you know, they tend to speak their mind very, very soon before the process has even started. Uh, and with me, I've always got a, like a strategy, a plan of action to just to keep everything quiet. So, you know, because of my because of my superstition thoughts, superstitious thoughts, uh, this is how we've been doing it. And, you know, like, People get shit, oh, why you not tell us before? Even my close friend go, like, you hang around with us. What, you know, why do you talk about any of your stuff, you know? And I, and I said, look, you know, like, sometimes it's like, you know, like, I said, look, when you do taxi, when you pick a customer up, you don't tell me where you're dropping the customer off, you know? Or, you know, if I if there's some, let's say, a takeaway owner, I don't ask them where do you get your food from or how, how many customers do you serve today, how much money you made in the till. I go, this is how... I work with my clients or customers, you know, I mean, I respect their, you know, confidentiality, you know, I respect their uh, secrecy. And, you know, the, 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 this, this is uh, how the industry should be evolving, uh, really, uh, fondly, because we have so many good talent, so many good musicians. Um, and I always tell them the same thing. I go, look, whatever you do, whatever you plan, keep it quiet until it nourishes or flourishes, you know, until you make it happen. You know, don't tell anybody about it. Like, you know, go to your recording studio, do your product, don't show off, don't do anything until you've done it, then you go to market and release it. But a lot of people don't do that because they want to have that show off. Oh, we've got that new track coming out. We've got that new movie coming out. We've got, you know, they already released so much of the information in the public domain. And, you know, people got haters. Even I've still got haters, you know what I mean? Like, you know, calling me all sorts of names, you know what I mean? Bullying me, you know, make, uh, you know, even calling me a wife beater, even calling me, you know, nasty names, you know? And, you know, because they're just jealous because, you know, they don't want to see your success. They, you know, they want to see you demise because they're behind you and they want to they wanna bring you behind them, you know? So this is why I don't tell anybody of my plan of action. I don't want to uh, have haters, you know, putting negative energy on me, you know? I believe in all the positive, negative energy. I believe in all the universe. Now, I mean, I'm a very spiritual man, a very God-fearing man. And so, you know, I educate a lot of these artists as well. You know, uh, I run an education program. I explain to them, look, this is how you should be uh, approaching people, how you should be, like, exposing yourself. Don't give too many exposure. People could be stealing your songs, your lyrics, your flow. You don't want that. You know what I mean? Your flow, your lyrics are your own unique intellectual property. Yeah, I mean, if you show off and, you know, like if you go out there and, you know, you know pre-promote yourself early, you could damage yourself, you know? Yeah, definitely, man. And uh, that's definitely sad advice and stuff, especially for, you know, young people aspiring mm. to get into the industry or even people that are just in the industry and, you know, maybe just haven't had that kind of consultancy or advice and just trying to figure things out along the way. Sometimes they can fall into just the habit of just, you know, as you said, overexposing themselves at some points it can happen. I think, um, you know, the point about, you know, the evil eye, so to speak, it, it, you know, is a thing which is sort of like, I guess, in one aspect, can be like a catch-22 with modern society that promotes the constant or incessant need to, um, you know, put yourself out there and, you know, posting social media and that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, it's just being then mindful within that, as you said, because, I mean, even myself, some of my early days on social media, you know, and I was at it before it really took to the, you know, the wider world of it being like a, a thing thing because, I've always been on computers, so even when I was on computers before, you know, everybody was kind of on a computer. It was, a, you know, the thing to do. So, um, oh yeah, definitely. That, you know, that, that, that's the thing. With, you know, what is the, the problem with the uh, the hip hop industry and and you know uh, the music industry as a whole? Whether you look at the Asian side of music or the hip hop, you know, you know, people don't want to see you rather than like uh, I'm talking about the British type of scene because America is different. America, you got that diversity and the unity in the hip hop industry. But in the UK, they want to bring you down. They want to like, you know, they want to mentally damage you, emotionally damage you. They want to criticize you. They want to put fake news about you. You know what I mean? Like just so that you mentally lose track. 
You know what I mean? Of wh- who you are, what you are. You know, like rather than saying, here, we're going to support you. You know what I mean? They start attacking your family. They start attacking your career. They start attacking your uh, your profession. Just they're jealous because you, you're doing something what they can't do. You've broken the ice. And that's why they haven't broken the ice. You broke the ice and you're taking the breath out of it. You're coming out of the, you know, cold. And this is the thing that I believe, like, I meet a lot of musicians and I tell them, so I go, look, the only way you're going to make it big is when you collaborate. You know, when you got to get that hate out of your heart, get that enviness out of your heart, collaborate with new musicians. You know what I mean? You never know, you might meet a musician that might just like, you know, get you lucky. You know, and that sometimes that ego gets in touch with a lot of these people. Uh, and they, they want to do everything solo. They don't want to collaborate. They don't want to interact. Like you, I've seen your collaboration with Tito. I've seen you, you work with so many artists. That's amazing because you, you, know, you, you know what you're doing. You, you open your skills and abilities and you're learning from them as well. But a lot of the artists, they don't want to do that. They want to keep in that bubble and they don't want to like learn from nobody. They don't want to share their idea with anybody. And, you know, and they're thinking like, you know, they, they might do a few tracks and think the M&M or 50 Cent, you know, that is the worst thing about nowadays with the British uh, music industry. So they become divas, you know, like I call them disco divas because, yeah. that, you know, the power gets the head too much. And I mean, rather than learning more, like, you know, I'm like, I've been in the industry for 25 years, uh, fondly, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning from new artists, musicians, producers, uh, film directors, you know what I mean? I had a um, a couple of Bollywood uh, film directors called me up. I'd like, you know, because I've now become a casting director. I want to learn more about it. I don't say, oh, like, you know, I've been a casting director, you know what I mean? And I've, you know, put my ego up. You know, like, I want to learn more and more about it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't say, oh, look, I'm a hip-hop promoter and why should I listen to you? I think that people don't listen. They are their own loss because they missed the boat then. Once you miss the boat, you can't go back to it then. And that's why, like, for me, if, if somebody comes to me, like 18, 19 year olds, and you know, you know, I'll talk to them. I won't ignore them. I'll say, look, okay, what is your opinion? What is your ideas? What are your thoughts? I'll give them a chance to talk. I'll get a chance to learn from them. You know, yeah. You know, a lot of the people in this industry, uh, from, they tend to ignore the young talent. They ignore the young youngsters in the music. They tend, they all because they've had the experience. They don't want to listen to anybody. While me, I, you know, if somebody comes to me, an like 18 year old. 25 year old, 30 year old, male, female, black, Asian, white, you know, I mean, you know, any color. I'm willing to listen to their, you know, what they want to say, their thoughts are. You know, I mean, I'm an active listener, you know, I mean, and you know, I believe listening improves your work better, you know, I mean, because there's certain things you could pick up that you could like, you know, utilize. So, you know, that's the issue with nowadays with a lot of the artists that we have, you know, I mean, a lot of the musicians that we have, they don't want to listen, they have that ego issue, they got that. Yeah, they want to stay in their bubble. They don't want to expand the knowledge. Uh, they don't want to help out with anybody. And, you know, rather than helping people, they want to attack people. They create memes about them. They insult them. They swear at them. They target their family. You know, rather than talking to them, they, you know, so w- once that negative energy comes on, you have to go away from that negative energy. You have to get rid of it. You have to walk away from it because you can't be dealing with musicians who can't, you know, who hate your work. And they're not big themselves, you know? And so I, my advice to all artists and musicians, look, you know, no matter how many years you've got experience, you're still learning. You know what I mean? You're still learning new beats, new lyrics, new uh, casting. So always, always, you know, like, um, you know, think that if every day is a new day, it's a blessed day, God has given you breath to breathe, uh, to breathe. Use that to learn something and contribute to the society, your community, you know? And it's hard work. And I know it's hard work listening, but they have to do it because the, the reason why a lot of the rappers are made it big in America because they listened. They didn't go, oh, we're not going to listen to you. If they had that not listening attitude, they never get a record deal. They won't be where they are. They won't be getting tours and gigs, you know? So I believe in the British music industry, a lot of, they are a lot of disco divas, you know what I mean? They're like, you know, you know old school producers, uh, singers, but they're not gone anywhere in life. The one of the reasons why I've been successful is because, you know what I mean, like uh, I've, I've listened to people and I still listen to everybody, you know what I mean? Like I don't say, oh, I'm Sabi Khan, you know, I'm the award-winning uh, hip-hop promoter and I'm a, I don't do that, you know what I mean? I like to listen, I like to build bridges, I don't like to burn my bridges, you know what I mean? I, you know, if somebody's made a mistake, if I've made a mistake, I like to apologise, I like to sit down and talk to them, explain to them, I like to hear their point of view. You know, that's how music should be. This is how we should be connecting people. 
it's really should not be about enviness and hatred. And I mean, it's a, we're in a very limited bubble. You know, I mean, we should be sticking together. And unfortunately, 90% of the British artists, which I find, they do that. You know, I mean, they, they don't want to get out of it. No, I definitely could concede a lot of that. And I think, um, you know, some of the points you made there is a good way to close and just giving people advice and stuff like that. You know, on that note, if anybody wanted to get in contact with you for maybe a media consultation or anything as such, uh, what they find you on social media? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Fondi, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. And if anybody wants to email me, my website is www.sabikan.com. The spellings are S for Sierra, A for Alpha, B for Bravo, Y for Yankee, Khan, K for Kilo, H for Hotel, F for Alpha, and for November dot com, Sabikan dot com, and my Facebook page is uh, Sabikan. Uh, sorry, face, uh, Facebook slash Sabikan uh, Media. I've got over thirty thousand followers from around the world. You know, what I mean, and I advise people on a daily basis about you know, you know, mental health in the music industry. Uh, you know, like if they're getting abused, how to combat that, you know what I mean? And how to be positive, how to create a positive energy. You know what I mean? I also advise them on meditation. Um, I, I advise them on like healing crystals. I advise them on like, you know, spending time with nature, trying to absorb positive energy from parks and fields. Give yourself an hour a day, go to the park, sit down, don't sit in the studio, you know, burning your mind out, you know what I mean? Uh, getting stressed out, you know what I mean? Uh, Take time out from the studio, take time out from work, you know, go to park for a couple of hours, go with the river flowing, you know, go somewhere somewhere to, with trunk, you know, tranquil and relax, you know what I mean? Then you know, flush your mind up with all the negativity, bring some positivity in and work forward. And I think a lot of the musicians, they suffer from mental health because they're not giving time uh, to themselves really from the, you know. That's it, you know, and look and you know, I know you you uh, you mentioned that I won the award for the Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I mean like you mentioned that on the on the call earlier on. You know, that's one of the reasons of why I got the Prime Minister's Award because I've been helping people um, with, through acoustic therapy, trying to like help them motivate themselves and using the, uh, my radio station. You know, I mean British Asian radio to help people to motivate and giving a chance for them to play new songs on my radio station. You know, and uh, and the Prime Minister saw my hard work. He wrote me a letter out. You know, I mean, and he gave me the Prime Minister's Award for that. You know, it's all my 25 years of hard work uh, from the, you know, I mean, like, Andy flies out uh, cold in the morning in order to, to helping people promote, then now developing new talent. You know, yeah, so, you know, like, getting these accolades is not very easy, especially from, you know, uh, the government where there's still an element of racism inside it, you know? No, no. Yeah. And, you know, as you said, that's um, a long standing period of time of work, you know, so people out there, Definitely pay attention, you know, it doesn't really come over the I know sometimes we live in these times now where people think, you know, they can just be um, viral and become an overnight success. And sometimes, even though I feel as though people can reach certain heights within that, having yeah. the, um, longevity after that, where they'll be able to, you know, maybe 10, 20 years down the line, be able to look back with a, will their career be as, um, as soluble as it once was? But um, we definitely want to thank you for definitely lacing us with some game here on Genesis Radio, Birmingham and Battle Online. We're definitely going to have to have you back on at some point, maybe explore some more stuff around just the mental health aspects in hip hop and some of the UK music. I think that was some good points that um, we agree with, but we didn't want to go Thank you so much. Into, um, you, know. you know, I always advise people, I go, look, look at myself. In the 25 years of my history, I won five major awards. Right, more than any other hip hop promoter or hip hop artist in the UK, uh, and my award that being the first uh, British Asian Drew Ministry of Sound in 1998 in London, you know, uh, when it was like predominantly white uh, club, uh, and uh, then like you know winning award for best promoters in like Dubai, Ibiza, then winning award from the you know from Ministry of Defence in UK last year, you know, uh, for the Unsung Heroes Award and also the Prime Minister's Award last June. So, you know, I always say to people, whatever you do, don't uh, don't back off. Because sometimes when you lose hope in your work, you, 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 know, you, you know, you think, look, you know, oh, I'm, I've done it for five years. I've not been successful. It's not going to happen. Don't do that because whatever you do will come good in the future, whatever you are. It's like when I first started off doing events, 
like 25, I never knew I'm going to get a Prime Minister award. I didn't know I'm going to get a Ministry of Defence award. I didn't know I'm going to be working with big major rappers or artists, you know what I mean? Like, or doing events in Dubai, New York, LA. I never knew that. And, yeah. you know what and I think that's what's important to convey, especially back to young people, is because um, it's yeah. doing it for a passion and doing it for a want, not necessarily, you know, as you said, doing it for those outcomes because you couldn't foresee some of those outcomes then at that time. So, well, you know, it's like they don't understand some people the game had was those days, you know, when you had to be out in the cold or in the rain, putting up posters, handing out flyers. It wasn't for <laughs> to say, hey, I'm going to be, you know, awarded later on in life for this. But it's um a testament to, they say, you know, you plant seeds and then um you reap what you sow. Exactly. It's like my planting my seed like 25 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I'm like, if you water them every day or every month, you water your seed, you see the results after 25 years. When you plant your seed and say, oh, you doubt yourself and you bring that doubt in. And you know, the problem with the music industry, the lot the more doubters. And I believe doubt kill dreams. That is my philosophy. You know, once you doubt yourself, oh, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, oh, what will happen, that will happen. You know, once you start thinking that negativity, your doubt has you know, become reality. So my philosophy has always been you know doubt kill dreams so once you doubt yourself you've destroyed your own passion and dream you know like once it's like with me like like with this film project you know i mean what i've, what I've took on you know the the company called me up because they saw my accolades with the prime minister and you know the ministry of defense you know they said to me look we've seen your uh, success we've seen your motivation would you like to become a casting director and, you know, it was, a, it was a daunting task. You know, I mean, I've never done casting before. And I said, okay, fine. I mean, I didn't say, no, I can't do it. And, you know, why would I do it? Who can I get? You know, I didn't doubt anybody. I didn't I didn't doubt myself. I said, okay, it's a new challenge. I want to take it on. I want to commit to it. Because my mum always told me, look, you know, so never, ever be scared of new challenges. You know, I mean, always give your work because God is behind you. There's a reason why that person's come to you because God is with you. You know what I mean? So, you know, that's why, you know, like I took the challenge on, you know, I mean, being spiritual, being, um, you know, um, believer in God, faith. And I said, okay, if I don't do it, if I, you know, if I do bad, well, at least I've learned something from this, you know. I, you know, if I've been, you know, not successful in finding the right cast for the movie, maybe like it's not my, you know, thing, maybe I'm not destined for it, but thank God the way I, you know, arrange the cast, you know, I mean, and, you know, I've been successful as a casting director. And, you know, if I start doubting myself, like most of the artists do, you know, they can't get anywhere, you know what I mean? And this is what I tell the youngsters. I, I drill it, I, like I drilled in my son's head. And my daughter, who's 11 years old, she can DJ. She's become a proper DJ at the age of 10. You know what I mean? Now she's taking singing lessons. And I, and I keep telling them, look, don't believe, don't doubt yourself. Keep doing it, keep doing it. Because one day, you, you know, your dreams will come true. Yeah, no, definitely. That's why it's advice and stuff like that. You know, and uh, we echo out that sentiment to the young people and the listeners out there. So we appreciate everybody tapping in this week, and we're going to be back soon on the line with some new updates. You can join us weekly for different content throughout the week on social media, Facebook for different playlists, Twitter for engagement, and Instagram for all that other crazy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and also also follow me on Instagram, Sabi Khan Promoter. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So, like, you know, Sabi Khan Promoter there as well. You know what I mean? So, yeah, follow me on anything you want advice in regard for, like, mental health, music, you know I mean? entertainment. I'm here because, like, you know, I could give you vast knowledge. What I believe knowledge should be exchangeable. I don't believe knowledge should be kept to yourself. You should share your knowledge of God give you ability, education, you should share it to people, you know, and um, you know, so where, anywhere I could help uh, artists, musicians, you know, even if you just want to like, talk about the entertainment industry, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about this, you know, and that's where we could talk about the next project, if only we could talk more about the entertainment industry and how people are, you know, the conspiracy theories, you know what I mean, and how, you know, exposing the certain uh, pros and cons of the music industry, that'd be a really good conversation next time. Oh, yeah, no, that sounds good, man. I look yeah. forward to it, and we appreciate you definitely taking your time out on this yeah. one. We know you got a lot of busy projects and stuff that you can't mention, but we look forward to seeing some of them roll out. And as, as you mentioned, like the film projects and stuff, that's something different for people to be excited about and stuff as well. We know that music and film often goes 
hand in hand, but with film, you get to explore a wider variety of range, I feel, though. So it's like a natural progression sometimes to get into that state. Yeah, I know you asked me last time about my yacht in Dubai. And, uh, yeah, th- yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I've, um, I'm working with the uh, contractors in uh, Dubai. It's like a luxury company. And, um, like, I've got a partnership in there. And we've got, like, you know, eight, 12 yachts out there. You know, I mean, E-Yacht, E-yacht is worth, like, about $3 million. Uh, And, you know, that's very good because I'm going to be giving... Uh, the the cars and the yacht site for people who do music videos in Dubai. You know, I mean, I want to give them a chance to promote the music. You know, I mean, give the opportunity of to give them space. So, you know, that's one of my overseas projects. You know, I mean, is um, you know, to running this uh, yacht hire company in Dubai, which is going really well so far. And hopefully, fans, if you can shoot your video there next time. No, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that'd be that be interesting, yeah. <laughs> no, my boy Flas um, from Vegas is trying to get out there. Shout out to Flas, man. So let's see yeah. how we get to make that happen. But yeah, we're gonna connect up soon. You know, thank Flash you, bro. Flash, thank you want to give to the fans or some people out there? You know, I like to thank all my fans. I like to thank all uh, the people who have uh, traveled with me in this long journey. Um, you know. Yourself, Fonzi, um, AC, Terra, you know, I mean, Jens, Elijah, you know, uh, from London, uh, big up to you guys. Um, I'd like to thank, you know, um, Paulo Molina, the Black Eyed Peas manager. I'd like to thank, you know, um, Chris from the Death Squad, you know, uh, who will give the opportunity to work with Keith Murray. You know, I'd like to thank the management of Ministry of Sound in London. Um, who will give the opportunity to host my one of my first events there, you know, and also to, like I said, my, you know, my biggest uh, thanks go to all my fans, you know, like my 30,000 plus fans on my Facebook Sabi Khan media page, you know, I mean, who message me, who check up on me, who want to learn about the music industry, the entertainment industry, you know. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody who supported me to the journey uh, for the past over 25 years. And um, and thank you very much for the uh, award which I received from the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Thank you so much. And also from the Ministry of Defence as well. I have to thank everybody who like uh, believed in me, saw my work, um, my contribution towards the community and the British society. I like to thank everybody. And I swear, thank you, Fonzie, as well. And, you know, it feels so, so, oh, so surreal having interviewed you a few years ago and now you yeah. interviewed me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels also surreal, but yeah. <laughs> well, it, won't, it, won't be, it won't be the last time, but yeah, that's how we do that. Yeah. Uh, back and forth, so, uh, family, this one, we sh- we're shooting this one out there for Genesis Radio, Birmingham, about that online.com. So, peace yeah. out. until the next one. Yeah, thank you. Good bless everybody. God bless you all. Yeah, thank you, and I'll catch up later on. Join us on the line, bout.online.com for the hottest UK, US flavor. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to be updated on new drops and content.